Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third webinar of the EPUS. Uh, it's good to see all the attendees again. This is going to be our last webinar of Ramadan, and um, hope you enjoy it. We have a very special assortment of guests tonight. I'm going to start by introducing our guests, by Dr. Parsa. Dr. Parsa is a, is a very international pediatric ophthalmologist. He graduated from New York, and after his residency, he took a postdoctoral fellowship in the neuro-ophthalmology in California with Dr. Hoyt. And then a pediatric ophthalmologist business fellowship in Baltimore with Dr. Guyton and the exceptional team there. It's actually rare to find someone with such combined experience. Not only is he double trained in neuro-ophthalmology and pediatric ophthalmology, but he has a vast international clinical research and research experience. He practices in Johns Hopkins, University of Wisconsin, in the Sorbonne University in Paris, and the Université Libre de Bruxelles in, Be in Belgium. He has a very respected list of publications. He is a truly international pediatric ophthalmologist and neuro-ophthalmologist. We're very lucky to have him with us here. Dr. Parsa. And uh, Dr. Farouk Orge. Very few people in the field do not know Dr. Orge. His CV is very rich. It takes a very long time to go through his CV. He um, spent a long time in Indianapolis, did residency, fellowship there, and um, we got to be friends from meeting in the, on those fellowship meetings there. He moved then to uh, Ohio. He, be, he became very prolific in his field. He's one of the most active pediatric ophthalmologists I've ever seen. Currently practicing in uh, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, University Hospital Eye Institute, Case Western University Reserve, Case Western Reserve University. Besides being director at large in the APUS, vice president of the IPOSC, medical director of quality in the UHI Institute, fellowship program director, I can go on for a very long time. In spite of all this, Farouk, if you may allow me to call him so, is a very humble and down-to-earth person, very friendly. We always feel comfortable around him. We're very happy to have him here. Next is my colleague and my professor, Dr. Nihal Um, We call her the wizard of pediatric cataract surgery. Uh, for those of you who do not know her, she's devoted to pediatric cataract. That's what she does all her life, and everyone enjoys watching her surgeries. Um, Dr. Ibrahim Al Adawi, my professor as well, a talented <coughs> surgeon, has always been doing those meetings in his hometown in Mansoura. When I was young, when I started my strabismus, learning about strabismus, he was one of those who, who taught me in the very, very beginning. Dr. Mohammed Farid, my co moderator today from Banha University, again, a very talented pediatric ophthalmologist, ophthalmologist who enjoyed working together on preparing this webinar. We hope you like it. Back. So without further ado, and myself, of course, my name is Amr Kamshushi from Alexander University. Without further ado, we're going to move to our presentation. Um, for those of you who, uh, who haven't joined these webinars before, you can use the chat buttons, as you can see, or you can use Q&A if you have any questions or answers that uh, questions, and we're going to answer these questions as we go through. We're going to go to the first case. Our first case is going to be an astagmus. As you can see here, look at this child. This child has been born with his nystagmus. This is infantile nystagmus. He has a preferred head posture. His preferred abnormal head posture is a left face turn. This is where the nystagmus dampens. In the primary position, the nystagmus increases a bit. When he puts his head to the left, the amplitude and frequency of nystagmus increases. So he prefers to put his head towards, the, sorry, he puts his head towards the left, the nystagmus dampens, and he puts his eye in right gaze. And then we would ask the audience to share with us in a quick poll. I'm going to launch the poll now. <clears throat> How would you treat a horizontal abnormal head posture of 30 degrees? Would you do a Kestenbaum Anderson procedure, an Anderson only? Kestenbaum Anderson. Kestenbaum only, augmented Anderson, none of the above. There's always variation in decisions in this kind of cases. We'll give it a few more seconds. Okay. As we can see, most people voted for Kestenbaum Anderson procedure seems like the most popular procedure. However, there is a variation of opinion. 
let's see. Uh, first, I would direct the question to Dr. Parsa. If you get a case of horizontal abnormal head posture, which technique would you prefer of these and why? Um, basically, I would, I would do what we're calling the Kestenbaum-Anderson procedure, recessions with resections, uh, because you have longer lasting results when you do an R&R &R, uh, than especially a resection, which tends to undo itself. And uh, recessions, which would give you some weakness uh, if by recessing a, a muscle too much, you would have to get, you would get weakness in, in its action. Um, what I would emphasize in a case like this though, where we saw the child with the head turn and we saw the less nystagmus when it was looking to the right, was uh, to be sure how much to move the muscles. That may not be the null point that we're seeing. Uh, the null point people usually think of as being where there's the least amount of nystagmus. But the true definition of a null point is uh, the point beyond which the nystagmus changes its direction. So even though looking all the way to the right, we see the nystagmus is at its minimum, it might have been that looking further right, uh, it would still be less and, and further right if we could, but it's blocked by the orbits, we would get the reversal of the nystagmus. So if we only operate for what the head turn is, we'll get an undercorrection usually. So we really have to put prisms in front of this child's head and, sort of their, and note how many degrees away does it take of looking until we get a reversal of the direction of the stagnus. That's the key point that uh, I see leads to many undercorrections. So That's interesting. So you always measure these kids with the prisms, not only the abnormal head posture. Exactly, exactly. Because the null point by definition is the minimum of nystagmus beyond which there's a reversal of the direction of the stagnus. That part is sometimes left out in definitions, and it was Craig Hoyt who used to emphasize that to me as, as being the number one reason why we get under corrections when we're doing, say, a keston mama anderson procedure, is that we're, we're, not look, we're not examining for the reversal of the stagnus and we're just doing the head turn, which is an insufficient measure of the degree of strabismus surgery we'll need. Dr. Elada, would you agree with this? Would you do a Kestenbaum Anderson for an nystagmus? Uh, yes. You combine that with something else. Yes, Dr. Amr. Uh, I, I used to do a Kestenbaum Anderson procedure recession resection uh, because recession only or resection only cannot correct such degree. Uh, recession only, I uh, reserve it for the vertical nystagmus uh, with the chin elevation or depression. Uh, can uh, uh, give a good result. But in horizontal, direct, in horizontal nystagmus, uh, usually I use the uh, Kestenbaum Anderson recession section. Did you ever experience a case of strabismus after Kestenbaum Anderson? Uh, unlikely to happen. Uh, rarely, rarely I, I made a case of strabismus following uh, nystagmus uh, surgery. And in such a case, I uh, uh, manage the case accordingly, according to the degree. So it's not a threat to be worried about? Uh, well, it, uh, I would say, uh, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Parson. I, I do worry about it in the sense that it's, it's very always possible to induce a strabismus in someone who hasn't had it. So uh, I try to defer surgery, if possible, till after the age of strabismic gambliopia, until they're eight or nine years old, so that if I do induce a strabismus, they'll be diplopic and, and not develop a suppression scotoma, and then we can reoperate. That's interesting. I mean, again, you delay the age of Kestenbaum Anderson surgery to eight to nine. Dr. Rada, would you agree with this? Do you operate at what age do you operate on nystagmus cases? Uh, usually, uh, uh, I operate at eight years, I mean, from six to eight years at the school or preschool age. Okay, you do preschool or school age? Uh, six to eight. Okay. Well, we started by the horizontal. We're going to move to something more difficult. Um, as you can see, we always have some studies that show different treatment options, large recessions, different numbers for recessions, um, augmented Anderson procedures. It's not only the Keston Bob Anderson, other people have different opinions, but see, our panelists agree on the Keston Bob Anderson. Now, this is the second case. This is a normal head posture in nystagmus as well. However, it's more tricky because a preferred abnormal head posture is a chin up. So this child 
has his null point in down days. Doing the surgery would cause challenges because you have to weaken the down gaze, you have to interrupt the down gaze. So it's not as easy as doing on the, the horizontals. We're going to go through a quick poll as well and then uh, hear the opinion of our panelists. Um, let's see what everyone thinks of this one. How would you treat this chin up of 25 degrees? Inferior rectus recessions, superior rectus resections, or combine them, do an inferior rectus and the superior rectus, or inferior rectus recessions and superior oblique tenectomies aiming at weakening all the elevators, or a horizontal muscle upshift. I expect to find more variations in answers in this one because there is less consensus on how to treat vertical abnormal head posture. And it's a good thing we're not going to discuss head tilts with nystagmus because that's going to get way too complicated for tonight. <laughs> so let's see our results. We seem to have um, variation in results. However, everyone agrees on we're doing, everyone is doing an inferior rectus recession and some are combining it with superior rectus resections. Now, um, we're going to move to Dr. Orge. What do you think of the vertical abnormal head posture surgery options? The surgical numbers, that's a question. I know you have some experience in that for the vertical and the horizontal. And um, at this stage, I'm going to stop sharing my slides in case you want to share a slide to explain your answer. I would love to. Uh, let me make sure that I'm. And the age of surgery as well. Do you agree that you do the surgery at the age of eight to nine years, or do you do it early, like five to six years? Um, I actually do uh, the nystagmus surgery is a little bit earlier than than what was mentioned. And and just to kind of uh, before I, I I show the the my preferred table on the vertical, um, I have to say that uh, the variations that you've seen uh, they all kind of work in a, in different scenarios. For example. If the child had a infantile esotropia, then developed a null point, which does happen, um, and you've done a BMR um, in a maximal fashion, what do you do? That's a very different problem than, than you've never had any uh, uh, strabismus surgery per se, and, and how to react on that. And the other thing is, uh, when you look at the historically, uh, how uh, it came up on, on the horizontal, then it translated into the vertical, on, on to do the, the procedures for the uh, null point nystagmus is, um, again, we all know about Anderson and Kestenbaum um, very differently came up with the um, ideas of nystagmus surgery in, in, in at the same year. That's why we kind of um, um, combine their names in that. Many moons later, uh, late Marshall Parks came up with this 8567 uh, rule that, that actually made sense to him. And, and I think the world adapted with that, uh, that and it was uh, mildly uh, modified by Dr. Van Norden as well. Um, the, the variations do work, and actually a lot of studies um, do show that uh, single muscles do work in, in certain instances, but you, know, you have to really augment the, the amounts. Um, we, I can tell you that for the horizontal in particular, that the four muscle large recessions are not as useful as we thought it would be, and, and does tend to cause the a big or, or some exotropia in particular, so strabismus. And, and um, I always thought that it was a little bit confusing. Uh, the eight, five, which muscle you do eight, which muscle you do five and six, seven. And what if we had a strabismus, how do you incorporate in that? Um, I actually remember reading uh, different papers about it and, and talking with Dr. Deloso. Um, he actually mentioned, he's a PhD that has spent his life in nystagmus. Um, he mentioned that, well, maybe we should do all the muscles in the same uh, numbers. And, and this discussion actually led us starting doing that. So for, for the horizontal, we've been actually doing these equal muscle surgeries. Um, and it just sounds very bizarre, but it actually does work. I have about 50, 60 patients so far since 2009, I think. And, and um, so you do, for example, for the 30 degree, I would do a 6.5, 6.5, 6.5, and 6.5. It's just amazing that it does work. Um, coming to the, the, there's the practicality and there's this technical, if you really want to be on top of things, I think you need to really measure the, the nystagmus in, in, with a nystagmometer. Um, and, and not many places do have that and it's just not a common thing. So then the practicality goes forward. 
Um, so the visual acuity uh, guides in that and actually checking the visual acuity in different gazes can be a guide as well for, for, for people. So back to the vertical. Um, so my algorithm actually is not very different from what Dr. Hurtel, um, Rich Hurtel uh, defined. And, and for the vertical, there are three options. Um, as, as you mentioned, um, and uh, for the bilateral superior rectus recession with the inferior oblique, um, actually, I'm going to go to the second one because that, that's the portion that you were asking for the chin up. Three options, again, the, the bilateral superior oblique tenectomy and the inferior rectus recession. And then bilateral infection and bilateral rectus recession. Uh, they all Although they all do work, uh, what works best in my hands and what I've seen, what I've talked with Dr. Hurtel is the first option. And, and, and um, how do you grade that? Um, and, and how do you do that? It's just, I think it's just a, um, and if you're comfortable with the tenectomy going to the superior oblique, I think is the guiding force for, for complications that have you always worry about these things um, and again scar tissue and many things just you do worry um, but similar to the Kestenbaum or Anderson Kestenbaum procedures that you do um, we actually don't really see that and 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 um, especially with the chin uh, not maybe up but the chin down position uh -huh. is probably a very devastating position but because they can't even look through the glasses and um, so that that affects the vision in, in so many different ways and and um, they, they tend to be fairly comfortable with that and, and they compensate with, with mild uh, maybe turns. But um, with this numbers that, that I've, I'm kind of showing in the slide, I've, I have not seen any restriction, uh, personally at least. Dr. Ladawi, um, um, about the indications of surgery, I mean, when you have a patient of nystagmus with abnormal head posture, when should we operate him? I mean, if he's complaining, if he's cosmetically complaining, is there a certain degree of abnormal head posture? Because sometimes we see this his head posture and the patient is not really complaining of it. When would you decide to do surgery? Mainly the amount or the degree of abnormal head posture. If the child uh, go to the school with a 30 degree of face turn to the right or to the left, this uh, will uh, is uh, this ability for the child. In, in the school. So the, the, main, the main indication is the amount of abnormal head posture. Okay, so the degree, depending on the degree of the abnormal head posture. Okay. Now, we go back to, uh, to um, our presentation and now we, we push up things a little bit up. We're going to see uh, a case, this patient. As you can see, she has an nystagmus, again, infantile onset nystagmus. But this time, when you put a base out prism, the nystagmus dampens. So um, her, when she attempts to do an adduction conversions, the nystagmus dampens. We don't see that. The, there's something called the artificial divergence surgery. It's mentioned in the literature, a little bit older literature but it does exist. I would uh, direct a question now to Dr. Parsa and his vast experience in nystagmus and nystagmus surgery. What do you think of these cases where the prism improves nystagmus? What do you think about the artificial divergence? Would you combine it with Kestenbaum-Anderson procedure? Would you do it on its own, the surgical numbers? What would you do? Well, uh, was, this patient didn't have any strabismus, so uh, I wouldn't combine it with any other procedure other than if, wanted, if one wanted to do surgery to do uh, um, the artificial divergence surgery. Uh, as a general rule, what I'll say is I'd always do a cycloplegic refraction and put them in their full correction before I decide on doing anything. Um, and uh, once I do that and see what their nystagmus may be, I'll repeat that prism test, see if we have similar results or not. Um, if it's... Uh, Obviously, what's happening is we're using the near reflex triad, convergence, meiosis, and accommodation that dampens the nystagmus here. Uh, one could get a similar result, presumably by putting over minus lenses in front of this girl's eyes. She would have to accommodate more, and that would 
give a similar effect and dampening the nystagmus. Uh, if she's very hyperopic at this young age, which is likely she has some hyperopia, and one does the divergence uh, surgery on her, it may work at dampening the uh, nystagmus, but as she gets older and she loses her hyperopia, she won't be able to elicit that same knee reflex without becoming without blurring her vision. Uh, so you run the risk of having a short-term positive result uh, by inducing a divergence for which she has to correct, uh, but then inducing later on a blur because after she, her eyes grow and she no longer is so hyperopic, uh, she would get blurred vision from induced myopia. So uh, I think the first thing is to look at what the refraction is in a child, cycloplegic refraction. Uh, perhaps play around with that to see if you can dampen the nystagmus uh, using just plain glasses, regular glasses, for example, over minus lenses. Um, and then if you find that's not sufficient or you're afraid of inducing more myopia, because that's possible with putting over minus lenses, uh, then putting base out prism. I would hesitate to, to do the artificial divergence surgery because I think it's intimately linked to the amount of accommodation that's also elicited and that will change uh, with time. It's, it's invoking the near reflex that dampens the nystagmus. And the near reflex has, has three components. It's not just the convergence, it's the accommodation too. So, uh, for our audience who are not familiar with the procedure, can you please go over um, what's, artificial, what's artificial divergence procedure and when to do it? I mean, when, when do, what's the case criteria where you do artificial divergence and what is artificial divergence? In a minute, can you wrap it up for us? Well, uh, I presume it's just recessing the medial rectus muscles so that the eyes uh, diverge, uh, they're more exophoric, and then by eliciting the near reflex, convergence and accommodation, uh, the patient will be seeing straight but with less nystagmus. And when do you do it? When do you do it? When do you decide you're going to do it? As I was saying, I try to stay away with it in the, in the pediatric uh, group because they tend to... Uh, lose their hyperopia as the eye axial length grows in eyes. And so a, a surgery that's initially successful at eliciting not just convergence, but accommodation simultaneously, hyperopic, they can tolerate it very well. But once they, as they grow older, are no longer hyperopic, they it will induce blurred vision. And then in the older patients, if you do that, uh, it can work, but then as they get presbyopic, they, are, uh, they have to uh, elicit more and more uh, effort uh, to uh, have the eyes straight. You might even get a, a, some sort of over-convergence at times. That's, I haven't run into that, but that's what you would think would happen. So the bottom line is I don't really plan on these surgeries so much. <laughs> Okay, so I try to use glasses, prisms, okay. and, and defer on it. And I haven't followed many long enough to know what happens later to them when they go off to somebody else's practice. So you're not a very big fan of artificial divergence. Okay, before um, Orge, uh, quickly we go. Well, I, want you, I want your quick opinion of, uh, in um, like the over minus glasses, uh, putting prisms in the glasses, and um, over corrections. What do you think of each of these, especially the over minus in glasses and putting prisms in glasses for cases of nystagmus? How often do you do that? So it actually what you're uh, referring to is probably more uh, to do with this type of case in the sense that the, co the, the convergence yeah. null nystagmus, which is actually very classical that you put seven base cell prisms altogether, 14, that's typical that, again, without any underlying strabismus, that's the key, because you may be getting into the uh, latent manifest nystagmus. So if I have a deviation, and you're correcting that deviation, then you may actually kind of see that the, the nystagmus, that's one thing. But if there is no strabismus, as Dr. Parsa mentioned, and, and you had uh, elucidated in this, actually with the convergence null, and if it is, and, and, and that's how you do, you put seven base out in front of both eyes, and if it dampens, you know that's the case. If you're going to give the prisms, because it, they do work, um, to the patient, you have to over minus, as Dr. Parsa was mentioning, just uh, because they tend to, and how much do you over minus? It's about minus two. 
Um, it's not a typical thing that this, this is, this formula doesn't work with any other nystagmus. This is mainly for this, at least in, in, in my experience and what I've um, done and, and seen in my clinic. Um, but, but for these patients, they actually do fairly well. Now, if they all work and they're happy, but they want to get rid of the glasses, uh, again, the procedure is, is Dr., as Dr. Parsa mentioned, I tend to do three millimeters of recession in, 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 in both medial recti. That actually co co causes this and, and um, it does help. But again, minus two um, sometimes is required after this. It's not atypical at all. So you I do artificial divergence procedure? I do. Uh, it, the indication is extremely rare though. Um, oh. I'm in a vicinity that actually, because of the, the, um, the Deloso and, and everybody else in the, so we see nystagmus quite a bit for, for, for um, even in that scenario, I can tell you uh, the indication came up maybe three times in the last five years. It's, it's actually very, very kind of uh, rare, in, in my instance at least. Yes. So, Dr. Mohamed Farid, do we have any questions from the audience or any uh, comments? Uh, up to the moment, we don't have uh, questions regarding the nystagmus cases. Okay, we have one, one question. It says, um, to, I think directed to Dr. Parsa, how do you measure it by the prisms? Can you, can you give us a little bit, a little note of how to measure it by the, how to use the prism to measure the abnormal head posture? How to use the prism in, um, in order to... Uh... Oh, you, you just put a, a prisms in front of the, both eyes uh, to, uh, as you see, and as you put more and more prisms, the head posture normalizes. You know, you, see, you try to uh, reduce the head posture with the prisms. And, if, and then you, you see the eyes as they become straighter for example, that one that was all in right case, as the eyes become straighter, what you do, uh, and you can see more sclera, you can ask the patient with prisms in front to look further that way and see if the nystagmus further reduces, and then to see when does the nystagmus reverse its direction. And then that's, that's what you know is the true null point. And you put more prisms and more prisms until the, you have the null point right in front. And you base the strabismus, amount of strabismus surgery, based on what the prisms tell you. That's how David Guyton, you know, <laughs> measure. It's not the five, six, seven, eight rule that Parks talks about. How much strabismus surgery would you do to correct what the prisms are telling you is necessary mm -hmm. to get the null point, the true null point, where the if you go to one side, the nystagmus beats this way of it, and if you go to the other side of the minima, the nystagmus beats in the other direction. And that I can't overemphasize enough, which is really the number one cause why we get under corrections uh, is not looking for that reversal of the direction of nystagmus about the null point. And uh, the prisms tell you how much to operate on. So you just go to the tables for your strabismus surgery and say, okay, I'm going to operate uh, on that much. Now, that's, you know, one way of doing it. Um, and uh, that's how I try it. I have a question, Dr. Am, from uh, one of the attendants. Uh, it's uh, for Dr. Orge. Uh, uh, they ask if, if a significant head posture in the age of one year uh, isn't waiting till the age of eight years can cause uh, significant torticollis. That's, a, that's a, a good point, and that's what's always brought up. But the fact of the matter is, for, for even a 30 degree turn, the, you will have the torticollis, obviously that's what we're talking about, 30, but in terms of getting cervical problems, that won't happen for at least two, if not three decades. So the, even someone with a large head turn, they're not going to really complain about neck problems until they're in their late 20s or in their 30s. So I, I emphasize that to the residents to say, we're not going to wait that long, obviously, but it gives us plenty of time to wait till say they're out of the strabismic amblyopic age range. And so we don't need to worry about this. It's a true fact that they'll get cervical uh, in neck issues, but we have to emphasize what is the timeline and it's not in preschool age where that will happen. I mean, they're so flexible and they're, uh, you know, they're, they okay. don't get- I have to okay. say, I have to say yeah. you agree? a different approach to that. The reason is, um, um, at least my training and, and, and how I kind of look at it is, and I try to kind of um, em empathize. I 100% I agree with, with many things that, that Dr. Paris and Dr. Uh, Ryan had mentioned, but I tend to get, get the approach on, if you know that it's consistent and you're getting the same amount all the time, because the, I think the most important thing to kind of rule out or not to miss is the periodic alternating nystagmus. 
Because if you've done an Anderson Kestenbaum for a periodic alternating nystagmus, then you're in really bad shape because it changes. And if you didn't give enough time for that change to happen, then you can actually do a wrong surgery for, yes. for the wrong indication. Um, in, in my cases, though, um, I, I have to say that any anomalous head posture is something that you can help with them with. And actually, even I tell the, the families, and I, um, if, if they, it's just not an easy thing to kind of look at the world like this. And they can maintain it simply because it's just tiring. And, and um, you are, and we tend to kind of, you can see by the visual acuity uh, how much of these, um, the patients have, have been affected by the, if they don't assume the head posture. And I actually tell the parents, turn your head and start walking and see, see how that feels. And, and in my case, I actually, I prefer to do them sooner. Now, my indication is it's not a particular age, but the consistency. They have to prove to me, or I have to see it at least in three different times, and I look at them actually for, for about 10 minutes, um, that they are sh showing the exact same amount. And actually, I, uh, PRISM method is fantastic. Um, I, I actually use, because the kids sometimes don't, don't allow you to do that, I use a protractor. I, I show a video from a distance, and actually I, I'm looking at the, from the top at the patient, and I, I use a protractor and use the nose as the direction on how, much, how many yes. angles, and that's how I practically do it. And that has been fairly uh, helpful, and, and, and actually I do it much earlier, um, even less than uh, two years and, and even less than one year in occasions, depending on the, the, the consistency. Um, I, I don't remember if any patient that I wished I didn't do it. I think that's the key part. Um, I haven't seen any problems um, that I had reversed, and all the procedures that we talked about, you can actually reverse it, um, and depending on the amount and how the surgery is done. Um, so I take a different approach in that sense. Right. How do you avoid uh, inducing a microstrabismus? How, how do I look at the microstrabismus? How do you avoid inducing a inducing. microstrabismus? Inducing. If a child has no strabismus but just has a head position, and uh, I understand uh, empathizing, but uh, when I ask an adult to take a head position that a child is taking, it's two different animals we're dealing with. It's much more tiring for the adult, for the child, than for the child. They don't complain of it. But unless in its extreme head position, and there are some cases where the child has an extreme chin up position and is arching backwards to walk, and then one would obviously operate earlier. But unless it's something that is really causing an immediate problem, I, I'm afraid of inducing a microstrabismus on someone who had perfect stereopsis. And the earlier one operates, the easier it is to do that and not even be aware of it. So uh, that's why I would rather wait until all things being given, given equal that the child can tolerate it. I'd like to wait till they're safely out of the strabismic amblyopia age range and then operate. Um, I think it's, it's easy to decipher less than seven, eight in much younger patients on, on microstrabismus. Um, I really do think that's, that's plausible. Um, obviously, I worry about um, under oral correction in any strabismus surgery that, that I do, including the nystagmus null point. But I have to say, my series, and we actually recently looked at it, um, maybe I, I was lucky, maybe, and, and it's just not only me, because I always have fellows and residents around, and it's difficult to hide stuff in that sense. And, and actually, we have the, the um, advantage of used to, not now, but used to have the LOSA actually uh, doing the nystagmus recordings on top of that. For our patients, um, I have to say I haven't seen. Um, so the microstrabismus for the amounts that we're doing is is not a common thing. It, it I think when you're doing drastic surgeries like big recessions in all four muscles, that's the time that people tend to see. I don't think it's common. Um, at least that has been my observation. Um, how often do you do you uh, think that that is gone? Because obviously that is a fear, and that has to be something that we all have to be careful in. Um, that, but there must be certain trials that you've seen um, that it actually induces this. I haven't come across with that. Uh, I, I think that whenever we operate on a child who doesn't have strabismus, okay, if, if they already have strabismus and nystagmus, then there's no proven. But if I know they don't have a strabismus and they just have nystagmus, aren't any trauma. Uh, uh, I'd like to see what the stereopsis results are of those children when they're adults 
uh, to see what happens. So. I would have to step in here. That's a very interesting discussion, and, and we all know that this could go on for a very long time. It will not be settled, even if we spend an hour on it. So <laughs> we'll have to go back to that and have a special webinar for that only, okay? <laughs> but for the sake of time, we're going to have to move forwards now. Uh, I'm going to uh, direct Thank you. Uh, now to Dr. Nihal Shafankiri and Dr. Mohammed Farid. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. We are moving. Um, the case is a six-month-year-old, um, six-month-old uh, baby uh, having uh, unilateral congenital cataract in the left eye, as you see here. Uh, we did her cataract surgery at the age of six months. Uh, concerning the IOL power, we didn't follow the DAHAN guidelines, which stated that we have to go for undercorrection by 20% under the age of two years. And we did only undercorrection by four diopters. So she was left with four diopters hypermetropia in order not to have an isometropia, no, uh, not more than four diopters. Um, immediately after surgery, we did fit her with the glasses with the four diopters hypermetropia, and we did start the amblyopia therapy. Six months after surgery, she was compliant with the glasses and amblyopia therapy. After surgery, still maintaining straight eyes. And then three years after surgery, yes, she had a clear visual axis and still maintaining straight eyes, but she was left with a myopic shift of minus eight diopters. And there is a non-compliance with the glasses. And she started complaining of intermittent exotropia. So the question is how to treat a minus eight diopters myopic shift in a three-year-old child after having unilateral pediatric cataract surgery? Would you go for glasses, contact lenses, corneal refractive surgery, or IOL exchange? Um, I'm going to launch a poll at this stage, and let's see. The poll, the poll would be in, at, at the end of the presentation, Dr. Well, we can. Yes, okay. I think that's one of those polls that will not have a consensus. And I have done my work. Like uh, big diversity. Yeah. Okay. As we can see, these. Uh, yes, yes, there's divisions. Division in the opinions. Okay, Dr. Nihal, you can proceed. Okay. So, well, actually, as for me, I cannot go for glasses because she's totally incompliant now with the glasses and uh, she's left with a, a, a fear that if she's not uh, going to wear her glasses, uh, she's going to go into amblyopia and the intermittent exotropia is going to be constant exotropia. Uh, she maintained a good vision among the, the past three years. Uh, so the glasses is not, uh, I cannot uh, choose it. Uh, contact lens, it's not actually a um, possible thing, at least in my patients, due to many factors. It's not only for the socioeconomic uh, state. You have to change the contact lenses every now and then. It may be lost every now and then. Uh, we don't have the still soft lenses or the contact lenses, which is possible to fit uh, for uh, for infants and children. Uh, the weather, the hot, the humidity, uh, uh, the hygiene risk. So the contact lens actually 
uh, it's not a possible choice for me. Uh, concerning the corneal refractive surgery, it's too early to go for a corneal refractive surgery because she developed a myopic shift of lioness eight in three years old, when she's three years old. As you all know that 80% uh, of eye growth occurs in the first two years of life and 20% of the eye growth occurs at the age from two until adulthood. So she is liable to have, if we go for a cornea refractive surgery, even if the, if the cornea uh, permits to go for a cornea refractive surgery for a minus eight diopters, she may develop another myopic shift in the late teens. Maybe it's not gonna be of a minus eight diopters. So I prefer uh, to preserve the cornea and leave it virgin, maybe for a future uh, cornea refractive surgery if needed in the future. So actually, I prefer to go for an IOL exchange. When you go for a straightforward cataract surgery and you know, and you choose the right IOL, uh, you dilate the pupil like that. And it is possible with a thin ski hook to rotate the IOL easily. There is no adhesions in the bag to rotate it easily here into the anterior chamber. And then with a, through a side port with a 23 gauge forceps, you hold the intraocular lens. And with the long vanus scissors, uh, you have to use the 11 millimeter blade. You can cut the intraocular lens into two pieces and then get out the first piece, rotate the second piece and get it out. And then you can implant uh, uh, the IOL, a multi-piece, unfolded and rotated in sulcus easily. Single piece hydrophobic IOL inside the capsular bag between the anterior and posterior rectus. A time of IOL exchange, you can easily dislodge it outside the capsular bag. There is no adhesions with these intraocular lens, when you choose the right intraocular lens, you get it inside the, the anterior chamber, and then you, again, you cut it into pieces easily, get it outside the back. And in some cases, with single piece intraocular lens, you can reopen the capsular bag again and re-implant the multi-piece uh, intraocular lens inside the capsular bag. You can see here that the haptics inside the capsular bag. And here, the child, years after IOL exchange, uh, the IOL is located inside the capsular bag. Maybe the haptic is slightly compressed, but the IOL is central and we have a clear visual exit. And each summer in ring, we can aspirate it and we can open the capsular bag and re-implant the IOL between the anterior and posterior rexes. As for me as a take home message, that the IOL exchange is not that difficult. And it can be one method of treatment of myopic shift after unilateral congenital cataract surgery. But in one condition, if you go for a good primary cataract surgery, anterior and posterior exits, and you choose the right IOL, because not all uh, intraocular lenses can be easily cut and, 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 and there is no adhesion. So you have to choose the right intraocular lens and place it perfectly between the anterior and posterior rexes. If you do so in the future, you can go for, you can do the IOL exchange and place it in the sulcus. And even you can perform optic capture inside the capsular bag as I previously showed. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nehal, for the nice case and nice presentation indeed. Uh, of course, uh, situation we are expecting uh, some more questions and some more debates uh, and the, the question now is Dr. for Bar, uh, is for Dr. Barsa regarding uh, uh, surgery for unilateral cataracts uh, in this uh, young age uh, the child was about uh, six months old do you prefer uh, do you prefer after removal of the cataract do you prefer IOL implantation or using a contact lens uh, uh, I have to first say we're obviously dealing with a master surgeon here and um, I think more and more the tendency at six months of age is we can put in you know, IOL uh, implants. Uh, so, and especially I heard about the socioeconomic conditions about having a contact lens uh, put in, they obviously get lost frequently and uh, it, it 
it, it can be better to put an IOL. It may even reduce glaucoma incidence. There's a debate about that. So uh, I thought that was uh, fine. I have a question for Dr. Mihal, though. Uh, given the myopic shift that occurred, so it was pretty dramatic in, in this case by age three, uh, could you have considered doing the IOL exchange a little bit later, later, say at age five, because a silicone contact lens might still be tolerated until age five, and maybe they're not too expensive, and further see how much myopic shift there would be or not, so that when you do the IOL exchange, you're doing it for the, the closest amount to an adult uh, uh, refractive correction. In other words, buy a little time um, before doing the IOL exchange, with, with a silicone contact lens that's usually tolerated till age five? Um, well, actually, number one, the silicone lenses are not available in Egypt. And number two, uh, the concept of contact lenses in children in Egypt uh, is not actually a good idea. We have a very high risk. We, we used to use it in the past. And and uh, we had a very high risk of infections. Mm -hmm. So we don't use uh, contact lenses in Egypt for uh, uh, cataract, after cataract surgery. So it's not an option actually in Egypt, although but, it's a beautiful option. So what is the youngest age then? I mean, so you're putting it as a primary procedure uh, in, in two well, months old? Uh, well, actually, be, be, uh, concerning unilateral congenital cataract, the youngest age I go for IOL implantation is six months. I don't go less than six months because, of course, uh, the curvature of the cornea changes massively. So, going to have the myopic shift within a few months and not actually a few years. So, uh, I even at the age of six months. And I, under, I don't undercorrect uh, massively to the 20% because I'm going to be left with a high hyperopia. I undercorrect from four to six diopters only in order to be able to fit it in uh, spectacles after surgery. So, so for the children who are younger than six months, how, how do you manage them optically? I go for cataract surgery and then I fit them with aphecic spectacles, half waking hours. Mm -hmm. I make uh, the fellow eye with the ground glass, and the baby wears the glasses just for half waking hours until his age of six years, and then I go for secondary IOL implantation. Okay, so it'll be the glasses. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nehal. Uh, which formula do you use uh, in, in your uh, IOL implantation? Which formula regarding biometry? Well, the formula which, which goes fine with me is the yes. SRK two. two. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, now there is a question for uh, Doctor Orge about uh, methods of avoiding myopia, progressive myopia in uh, unilateral cataract patients. Uh, do we uh, do we have a, a rule for atropine? <laughs> so such a fantastic question, and then um, just you. like. You, you uh, I just want to first of all congratulate on the fantastic surgery uh, that Dr. Nihal has, has performed as always. It's eloquent, it's, it's beautiful, and 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 um, as she mentioned, um, and I agree with Dr. Parsa in the sense that I think um, in in circumstances I would wait for that exchange for that growth because it tends to go. But again, um, it's so much person dependent and patient dependent and, and the situation dependent. There's no question in that. Um, so the, the myopia role and why is the myopia happening is such a, a loaded question and, and I don't know if we know the answers and, and it's been looked at and continues to be looked at. Um, the atropine is, is, a, is a fantastic thing that seems like it's just kind of everybody's trialing and, and many other, including the pedic studies have, have been trying to look into that. The atom studies have been look, looking into it, but no, as far as I, I know, no prospective study has been kind of looked into the, the, um, yes. this condition in particular. Yes. There are other conditions like uh, would that work in ROP babies that actually uh, we tend to we tend to see, um, or we, we with Stickler syndromes or neurodegenerative diseases, and 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 obviously the underlying uh, problem is is a little bit different. So I think it's it is it could be IOL dependent, and um, depending on what's causing this, is this the the peripheral blur effect that tends to to be, and is that inducing something? Um, is it the overcorrection or the um, um, because when you look at actually, and uh, Dr. Archer actually looked into this along with Dr. Monte, 
And that I haven't seen in my experience, and the IATS group has not either. Uh, but some investigators see that they actually go with emetropes, um, unlike the IATS group. And, and, and my formula, I still go along with the IATS numbers anyhow. And, and I think it's been shown again and again with the current technology, and unless we know that atropine is working, so would I use it? I, I think I would. Um, and, but I don't have the results for that at this point. But um, is there any way to predict this? Uh, people have looked into the other eye, the family's eyes, um, the, the genetic factors. I think it's hugely unpredictable. And, and it ranges from literally minus 10 to plus 10 of over and under correction, even much more than that. Um, so with the, and, and this is coming from the best surgeons that you, you would all recognize their names from, and they, they kind of depict this again and again, with everything done at the, with, with the, uh, the, with the way that you want, want them to do, and in prospective studies. So there's this unpredictability. Um, I think it's a, it could be a healing portion too. Um, it could be the IOL placement. Um, and again, all these things are speculations. Um, back to your question, I, uh, the right answer is I don't know. Uh, but but does the atropine have a role? I, I think it, it may. Um, so is there a harm to that? Um, I, okay. I don't know. And I would use yes, it. So, so you have any other bl blends of management for this case other than the IOLX exchange? Um, so the IOL exchange is, um, so I'm lucky in my facility, actually, we do give away contact lenses. Um, so uh, not many facilities can, can say that because it is not a cheap thing. And we had one patient, and that's, I think, how this spurred up anyhow, that uh, went through nine contact lenses and two of them, the, the baby ate it uh, and, uh, in, in, in three months. So what do you do? I mean, these are, in, in the US, it's about $300, $350. It's, it's not trivial at all. Um, and so, yes. unfortunately, the insurance doesn't give, um, it doesn't, because the, the contact lens is contact lens from the insurance company standpoint. We're lucky that we have an endowment that we do actually give away contact lenses. So for, for and, and I have an optometrist who is phenomenal in, in, in APAQ contact lenses, uh, taking care of that for 20 years. So when you have a facility like that, it would actually go along with that. And, um, and it, they do actually provide better um, optical correction than, and than the glasses, I think, especially when you have that kind of an yes. anisometropia. Um, luckily, the, the kids actually don't really complain of the anisometropy as much as we, we think they do. How do we know? Because of other conditions that you see these huge anisometropies and they still can see, have a decent stereo and, and actually have a decent vision if you can maintain that. So that's the good part. Um, but actually, I have to say, I was fairly shy myself about going back to the eye and doing the surgeries and kids. And um, although it didn't sound that way in the nystagmus talk, I'm actually fairly conservative in many ways. And and, and until recently, and we were discussing this again within a panel in, in APOS, and Ed Wilson, uh, um, I heard from him, and uh, like I've heard a lot of things from him and learned from him too, that he uh, was much more comfortable doing the IOL exchange. And, and then actually I started kind of being a little more cavalier about that. Now, I would still go along with what Dr. Parsa said, um, since because I, I actually go along with, can they con tolerate the contact lens? Can they tolerate the glasses? and wait until they grow as much as they can. Then, then, then if, you, if there's a compromise in the vision and the function, then, then that's the time that I go along with it. Um, if you allow me, I'm going to show a couple of things on, um, and, and other technologies that, that we use. Would that be okay? Can I share yeah, that? Okay, we will, share, yes, we will take it from the, uh, for at the end of the sharing. At okay. The end of the, uh, okay, okay. So these are the things no, I would question use. for Dr. Barsa about uh, the rule of corneal refractive surgery in such cases. Well, uh, I, I think I, I agree with everybody else that, you know, you, it's, the child is much too young to consider that because we expect further changes and, and uh, maybe when they're an adult, uh, it, it could be considered. But at this point, you don't have stability of the refractive findings. And uh, so I would stay away from that. I think the issue of atropine, I, I agree with Dr. Kruger, there's, I don't see much to lose by trying it. Uh, we don't really know exactly how it work or might not work, but there isn't much to lose. And it, it, these kinds of situations makes it kind of exciting to, to try, you know, with these uh, uh, rapidly progressing unilateral myopias. Why not? So that I, I, would, I would also say that's something to consider, too. But there's no experience, really, to, to guide us. Okay. Uh, a question for Dr. Nihal regarding... Uh, in case of recurrence of progressive myopia after IOLX change, 
Uh, well, it is, it is possible to have another myopic shift, but it won't ever be that uh, huge uh, because uh, already, already the growth occurred in the first two years of life. Uh, so we are expecting to have another myopic shift. Maybe uh, she's going to need this refractive surgery, but maybe in the teens or in the, even in the 20s. So definitely... You think of exchanging that one time? No, just one time. I cannot go for a second uh, IR exchange. Yeah. Just Okay. Uh, for Dr. Urge, uh, any other options regarding implantation of other types of IOL, like artisan IOLs or piggyback IOLs? You're absolutely right. So people have been looking into um, in, into this, um, and um, so you can actually do the piggyback. And actually, some uh, people knowing that uh, the shift is going to happen, uh, they go with the immaturization with the piggyback IOL. So when the shift happens, they take off the piggyback, um, which actually, yeah. in many ways, kind of at least it's minimizing the surgery because I think it's much more traumatizing. And, and we had a workshop. I mean, um, not that I don't know. And, and even, even in the best stands, still, this is a surgery. And, and if less you complicate it, it's, it's the best that you can do. Um, the artisan lens is, is, uh, is new to US. Um, we, we are still in the trials to kind of make it happen for the FDA approval. There are, I think, 12 sites um, altogether, as far as I know, that actually is looking into the pediatric Iowa, the artisan lenses but it's much more widely used in, in all around the world. The problem with the artisan, which it does work actually fairly well, for high myopia it does, um, but with an active kid and uh, may be prone for accidents and, and uh, mishaps, um, that, that could be an issue. So dislodging is a, is a thing to, to kind of know about. And I, I think if they dislodge, obviously just that could be affecting the cornea, um, but it does work. Um, and there are many instances in, in obviously Netherlands, they've been doing this for 40 years, four decades in different iterations. And, and um, they see that it actually works um, in their hands. And, and, and um, um, I don't have that amount of experience in my hands. So, but I have done artisan lenses for many AFIC and not for high myopia correction, but you're absolutely right. These are definitely options. Um, among them all, if I had the chance, and if I would do the surgery, I would do what Dr. Nihal did, um, and, and exchange the IOL, I would try to see if I can put it in the, in the do that is the, you need to know the anatomy, so coming back to that technology that we were going to talk about. And, and then if, if, if that allows me, then, then put it in the bag, um, in which you can. Um, if not, then, then a sulcus, but you still need to know the anatomy to really kind of choose the appropriate IOL yes. for that. And now back to the uh, uh, new modern technology that you uh, mentioned about uh, assessing the uh, integrity of the capsular bag using a new 3D uh, yes. UVM. So, so yeah, you can share it. You can share it with me. Okay. So I'm going to quickly do this. And there we go. I hope you can all see this. I'm going to mix it, make it. Um, can everybody see this? So, so for people who have not done or who does, has no idea what a UBM is, UBM is an ultrasound biomicroscopy. Uh, it, it is an ultrasound, but it's a very high resolution. Um, the typical ultrasound in the back of the eye would show around um, uh, maybe the optic nerve, so that would be 10 to 12, maybe 20 megahertz. UBM is considered to be a UBM if it's more than 40, if, uh, 35 megahertz up to 100. Uh, and, 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 and here, for example, it works fantastically because And look through the tissues. So I actually use UBM fairly well, frequently. And then the idea came up, well, can you actually obtain many images? And in this case, we actually get about 1,000 images. And, and can we stack them to make it a collage of these images? And, and we've been uh, working on this in the last four and a half years, I would say. And there are a lot of technologies that you have to kind of make sure that the images are, are acquired in the in an easy way, but, but um, hopefully the, these are the, some of the results. This is the first cadaver eye that we've seen. It really kind of shows you, and I, I, can you see my cursor here? My, um, um, the, the little- Yes, 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 yeah. Look at this round tissue. Um, and actually, you can see this is actually real. This is cornea. And, and I'm, I'm going to show you a little more examples. I want you to see this little circular structure there. You can't see this uh, really in individual images. That's actually scleral spur. Um, so some of all apparently is showing a little bit more than what we can see in individual patterns. And, 
Um, another example is the, maybe a iris cyst here. I'm just going to show this very quickly, just the sake of time. And you can actually slice and dice these images in any way that you want. And the advantage coming back to, I'm going to go, go through these slides a little bit more uh, faster, uh, is to kind of see the positioning of the IOL. Even if you have a secondary IOL, uh, I, we always worry about where does it, where does the haptic uh, lie? And, and to tell you the truth, uh, there is no technology. I mean, OCT cannot penetrate the iris to show this is the, the back view, this is the front view. And, and when you're kind of slicing these informations, you know exactly where the haptics are. You know exactly where the IOL is lying. Um, so if you, if you have a, at least a UBM to really look at these images and, and the right, uh, there is a, uh, this is a, um, a image, uh, a semi-automated uh, acquisition in the sense that it actually detects the foreign body so that you can actually kind of really turn the, the on and see exactly what it is. Um, again, these technologies seems like it's been helping with us um, to, to really choosing. Um, scar tissues do happen. You need to know where the proliferation of the lens does happen. And if you can actually see them uh, avoid and, and make sure that you take appropriate actions. So what we do is we actually take these images and, and look at them, study them, and, and do the surgeries accordingly. And that, that has been helping. So I'm going to stop it there. I'm going to stop the sharing. Very interesting indeed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ramur, if you have any more questions for you. Uh, Dr. we have a couple of quick questions from the audience because we have to move on for the sake of time. Um, uh, the first question is, is it easier for you to get out a single piece IOL uh, or a multi-piece one? And the second question is, uh, the second IOL, when you get to come to implant it, do you implant it inside the bag? Can you actually re reopen the bag after three or four years and put it in the bag or do you put it in the sun? Well, actually, both. You can get out the single piece and the multi-piece outside the capsular bag. As I told you, it depends on the primary surgery. If it is a straightforward surgery and you use the right intraocular lens, because not all intraocular lens can be, actually can get it outside. For example, if you have the hydrophilic inside the capsular bag, sometimes doctors use this IOL, there is fibrosis around the haptics and it's very difficult to come out. And if you use a PMMA IOL, it's very difficult because you're gonna have a large wound to get it outside and gonna give, there will be fibrosis and sometimes it's, extremely difficult to get it outside. What's so wrong about multi, I mean, would you use a multi-piece IOL or a single piece? Are they both equally easy to get out of the bag? Yes, but with a single piece, you have a sort of preservation of the capsular bag. It is possible to re-implant the IOL again in the capsular bag if you primarily use the single piece. Yes. Uh, but of course, it's not in all cases. In some cases, you can re-implant inside the bag. And if you don't uh, implant inside the capsular bag, you can do easily sulcus IOL with optic capture technique. And actually, we did thousands yeah. of cases. Thank you, Dr. Nian. Now we're going to move to the third case today. Um, Dr. Orge, um, you're up next with the case. Uh, if you would be kind enough to share your slides and start your presentation. Dr. Orge, um, um, can't hear you, you're muted, so can you please unmute the mic? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, fantastic, thank you. And actually, amazingly, the, the program reminded me that, that I was actually muted as well, as well so <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, not every surgery is, is, um, is, is DP, and, and sometimes then things do happen. I wanted to share um, things that um, I hope you never come across with, but sometimes certain things you come across with kind of stops your heart a little, a little bit. And, um, and, and maybe pick, pick your, your kind of uh, brains in the, in the sense and, and what to do when something happens. So um, she, is, she was a 54-year-old at that time and with a history of a long-standing strabismus who she had a surgery about 30 years ago, actually multiple surgeries um, since then, but she had a consecutive exotropia and we don't have any records on what was done, uh, but the surgery appears to be at least they've, they've done a BMR um, by the decipher. 
And in the examination, um, and I don't have the videos and the pictures, I, I apologize, um, but I think it's relatively irrelevant. I'm going to kind of come to the, to the point anyhow. Um, she did have a minus two adduction deficit in the left eye. Um, so we plan to explore the left medial rectus thinking that maybe this is a slip muscle, a elongated scar, something that is going on. And, and, and that's what we did. But, but when we started exploring the muscle, we, we just could not see any signs or extension of the left medial rectus. Uh, maybe a few fibers in way distant, uh, uh, but not surprising with a minus two adduction deficit. Um, since we, we saw that, we said, well, let's kind of transpose. Now, there are a lot of ways to transpose the muscle, and I get it. Why not do a, just one muscle versus a partial this, that? We, we felt in this case that the left inferior rectus and the left superior rectus full tendon transposition was the way to go. And um, so we first, um, the, the, the left inferior rectus was identified, hoped, cleared from the soft surrounding tissues. And, and while I was actually kind of, I did uh, pass the first um, bicral in the center, then I reached out to get, get a Q-tip. Then all I heard, and, and it's a fantastic sur surgeon, my fellow at that time was, was holding the muscle with, with the hooks and I heard the swoops. And, and um, um, again, uh, she has, uh, the, the, the fellow had amazing hands, and, and this, I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's anything to do with that or not, but the oops never sounds good. Then when I looked at the area, I couldn't see the eyeball. Uh, the area was covered in blood, and, and the hook that she was holding um, and, and, uh, uh, was, was, was free in the air, and, and the fellow had this devastating look in her eyes, and, and as if, what did I do, and what do we do now? So it kind of looked like this. Uh, this is the the portion that I had passed the suture. Can you see my cursor there moving? Yeah. Fantastic. And, and this is the surgeon's view. That's the superior aspect. And these are locking forceps. So we're trying to kind of identify what would be so this piece. Um, and, and we could see the, the suture uh, kind of that was, we didn't even do the tie, the, the center. This is after we cleared the blood trying to assess what's going on. Um, and then we were trying to kind of find uh, the other piece of the muscle. Um, now I have to say, and we're going to on um, at, in the case, but I have to mention, if you're going to have a uh, maybe pulled in two, maybe this is the best muscle to have a pulled in two syndrome. Um, the, the reason is, as you all know, there is an attachment um, that, that the inferior rectus in a deep tissue with the retractors as well as the oblique structures, the inferior oblique, all kind of connects deep down here. So the, in general, when, when this kind of a trauma does happen, um, it, it's actually unusual not to be able to find this uh, portion of the, the muscle itself. The trick to that is, which I had um, accidentally learned um, on my own, then was confirmed by Dr. Baker many, many years after. I, I had seen another, thank God, I had seen another trauma patient who had split in two, then it was caused by the trauma. And I had accidentally was, had pushed the eye, the ball down, and that retropulsion of the eye allowed this, this piece of the muscle protruding up. And that was the trick that I can tell you, that, that we had actually kind of, as soon as I pushed the eye down, I saw this and I, we caught it with, with, the, with the locking forceps in both ends. And what we, what we did from there is, was uh, just to kind of put these muscles together. So first of all, you need to identify, make sure you have the entire thing and really assess if there is multiple pieces and what type is, uh, what portion is, is broken. In this case, it was a relatively clear cut right into center, it kind of snapped and that's exactly what happened. And, and then we actually, um, and there's a long debate that we can actually kind of uh, talk about which searchers to use and all these things. I use the Vicryl and that's what I've used in the past, and, and uh, I, um, I did not so, so, so far regret that either. Um, but you can. You can use a, a permanent mercelene or, or nylon suture if you wanted to, uh, proline. But I use the Vicryl. I, I used actually three, um, uh, 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 almost like a mattress initially, then, then reinforcement in the center. I really want to make sure that this muscle was securely kind of tied to this. Well, then the question is, what do you do uh, for this case? Um, now, now, you not only don't have the medial rectus, and the inferior rectus is kind of compromised, and, and what to do for this? 
and it, it must be a crazy day for me. I said, well, let's keep going. It seems like the muscle looks fine now. And that's what I did. Um, so what we did is we actually secure the muscle and, and continue with exactly what we wanted to do. Um, I don't do this typically. Normally, uh, if uh, imagine this is where the medial rectus is supposed to be. And, and it would be around here to, to here. And I said, well, instead of putting it at the border where I think it is, why don't I meet them right in the center? And, and that's what you're seeing. So uh, it looks bizarre. So this is the superior rectus. This is the to almost meet with each other. I didn't put any other suture in between. And um, so that's what we did. And, and uh, keeping our fingers crossed, we got extremely lucky in uh, post-op day four. Um, uh, because of the inferior rectus, probably was not acting as well. And you can see the bruising. Um, all the extension of the inferior oblique, we talked about it. The, the, it just kind of goes through this, the retractors of the lid. And the, it's, this is not uncommon to see. And in, in, in uh, post-op day seven, she became ortho. And uh, talking about Ms. Thymus, uh, her vision was 2100 prior to the surgery done again and again. And um, I don't know, we induced a kind of a tenotomy reattachment of some sort. Her vision came down to 2060 within a month or two and, and, and prevailed that way um, since then. So we got extremely lucky in this case. Um, um, I am a blessed person in many ways, apparently. And, and um, uh, but, but I want to share these things, uh, not to show how lucky I am, but I am. Uh, but but things do happen, and and uh, I remembered um, actually um, um, uh, he has benefited from Gene Halveston quite a bit as well. Um, I, I remembered I always do remember uh, him saying better to do a good surgery for the wrong indication than a bad surgery for the right indication. Uh, but things do happen, so um, read it. Uh, make sure that every step that that you're it's well calculated and it's done for the right reason and in a in a good fashion. And the expectation of the patient so in the core discussion relax. So if there's any problem that is going to happen, you have to a lot of things can go wrong. I didn't mention the uh, pulled in two because I didn't expect that to happen. Um, but she was actually more calm than I I, I thought she would be. But I never kept it to myself. Um, it, I actually shared the entire thing with her, saying that this is exactly what happened. Um, but the important thing is keep your calm. And bad things happen. You have to kind of figure out what to do at this point. It's so easy to, to kind of um, be flustered and start yelling at everybody and this and that. That doesn't help anyone. Um, communicate with the patient when complications occur and just kind of good luck. And I think luck is a big portion um, of, of this anyhow. So that's, that's what I had in that. Florge, it's a very interesting case, and um, you kind of pushed your luck a little bit for this case <laughs> because uh, you know I, we have one one very interesting comment from one of our audiences. Just closer up, it's a bad day, and that's that's what I've what I've thought of doing. Like once you get the muscle lost, and then because actually a very um, it's, it's a lot of courage to actually transpose a muscle after being split and finding it. But um, I would like to highlight something that you said that I, I didn't actually know. I never did it before that you have a pulled in two syndrome. You just what you said is you have to push the globe down in the orbit, deep in the deep in the orbit, and that's how you retrieve the the lost segment. It it mainly works in it particularly works in the in the inferior rectus. So it wouldn't work in the medial rectus that I can tell you because there is no connective tissue. And actually, Kenneth Wright says that, and and I heard him saying this multiple times. It's kind of uh, funny and sad in a way because he said medial rectus is I'm uh, like me. He has no friends, and and I, I I doubt that's the case because I know he's uh, he's well loved and in many ways. Uh, medial rectus has, has not much connections to hold it together. And that's, the, that's why it's much easier to lose that muscle. So if that happened to medial rectus, good luck, my friend. It's just very difficult to find it, if not impossible. Uh, but the other muscles, I have to say, they tend to kind of stay in that vicinity, at least the, the ones that I've uh, heard. Um, I think a few years back, uh, David Granite and, and, and his, his medical student, I think, which I, not this, uh, sorry, I had another pulled into, um, that actually I, I had added to that, that case as well. Um, it does happen, um, and uh, it can happen in any muscle. Uh, it tends to happen more in the more fibrotic muscles. So thyroid is a good example, very tight muscles. And I think the instrumentation also is, is, is a key. Um, and obviously, I mean, I have to say, I mean, this fellow is phenomenal, and, and um, the, the fellow is now in a, in a very good institution leading uh, leading uh, the pediatric ophthalmology there, amazing surgeons. So things can happen in very good hands. 
Um, but it's realizing, I've, I've seen a close one that actually was happening in a, a chronic uh, progressive ophthalmoplegia patient. I kind of saw these fibers kind of ting, 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 kind of breaking up one at a time. I said, just kind of stop. And, and um, so certain muscles are a little bit more prone apparently. And I have to say, it has to be the tightness that at least that I've, I've seen and heard. The pulled in two syndrome in the, in the survey published in the JPUS says that it happens to uh, strabismus surgeons about once every 10 years. So it's not a kind of thing that you would develop an experience in by doing more and more. Um, and I want to direct my question to Dr. El Adawi. He's a very experienced strabismus surgery, surgeon. And any experienced strabismus surgeon must have come across one or two of those pulled in two syndrome. Dr. El Adawi, can you please give us your experience about the pulled in two? What happened? How to avoid it? Yes, uh, uh, I met uh, this case in uh, 2005 with a patient uh, 60 years old with uh, neglected six nerve palsy, and the eye is fixed in abducted position with positive force reduction test. So, uh, so as, uh, it is very difficult even to hook the media rectus. Uh, after I uh, opened the conjunctiva, hooking the media rectus, the eye is fixed in uh, adducted position, uh, uh, whereas the, the, the assistant pull the eye in order to facilitate to take the suture, I hear up and the, the muscle is cut. Uh, so the, 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 the main risk factors in such a case, most of cases occur in old people uh, uh, and in pathologic muscle such as uh, uh, neglected uh, six, uh, neglected uh, palsy, uh, previous ocular surgery, uh, thyroid eye disease, chronic external, external ophthalmoplegia, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, how to avoid, uh, uh, you have uh, to have a somewhat experienced assistant in order not to uh, hold the muscle aggressively. Uh, also not to, uh, dis not to do much the section of the tenon capsule in order to see the, the opening in the tenon through which you can retrieve the muscle. Uh, if it happened, uh, you have to uh, retrieve, try to retrieve the muscle, uh, but the, in, in the medial rectus is very difficult sometimes to retrieve because it will retract backward. Uh, but in such a case, I can retrieve the, the muscle and re it again. Uh, 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 Obviously, it can it happen in a child? Is it possible to see that in a child, or do you think it's very unlikely to see it in a child? Uh, I think it is unlikely, in, even in literature, that it is unlikely. Most of cases of uh, uh, in tooth syndrome occur in old age and in previously operated muscles, in diseased muscle. Okay, uh, uh, very rare uh, to occur in a uh, child. Dr. Parsa, um, Come to the more difficult situations. What if, if you lose the muscle and, and you get it pulled in two and you cannot retrieve it? What would you do if it's a medial rectus or an inferior rectus? Like in the surgery, lost and you cannot get it back. Well, first, uh, I emphasize what Dr. Orga said. With the inferior rectus, because there's so many attachments to the inferior oblique, you usually can get it. Uh, for the medial rectus, uh, that's where I would actually try to and it's happened once, I'll try to call a more experienced colleague into the operating room, swallow your pride, <laughs> you know, get them <laughs> in there. And, uh, and the key, as was mentioned, is to, to look for the tenon sleeve and not go across the, across the globe looking for the muscle, but look for the tenon sleeve. Uh, I'll mention a, a, a little trick that one of my colleagues, Mustafa Sandri, mentioned in Iran, is he'll go into the sleeve with forceps and try to grab tissue that he may not see, but look at the vaso, if there's a vasovagal response on the anesthesia monitor, because if it's a rectus muscle you've got, you'll slow down the heart rate by pulling on it. So sometimes you may not be able to see the tissue your forceps has grabbed, but you can deduct, deduce that it's uh, muscle. So that's a little trick. If all that fails, the, the horrible situation you're saying here, uh, I would actually, uh, refer to uh, another uh, surgery, another day. I wouldn't go directly to a transposition procedure that day, but I would try to arrange with an oculoplastic surgeon, an orbital surgeon, 
to try and look again for it. And uh, I've been lucky that way. So uh, th that's kind of the algorithm that I would follow is, is look for the you know, lost muscle, then get a more experienced colleague, and then even schedule with an uh, ocular orbital surgeon. Okay. If all that fails, uh -huh. you, you see what the adduction ability of the patient is. And in the case that we saw here where the medial rectus couldn't be found, obviously there was some medial rectus attached to soft tissues that was giving some adductive effect. It was minus two, not you know, minus four. So in that case, the transposition procedure could work pretty well. But, so, but I would do that in a second uh, operation. Uh, so you would not even operate the other eye because sometimes you have, a, you have a surgical plan and once you get a, a pulled in two syndrome, you abort, uh, you abort your procedure and you, you go in another day to try to retrieve it. You don't do the other eye, you don't do a resection, you don't do anything at that, at that stage. Yeah, no, I, I, I try to go to where the problem is. And, and you try to take a stay suture to try to keep the eye adducted so that the muscle gets attached somewhere in the sclera towards the medial side. Because it's been suggested by a colleague once that if you take a stay suture, even sutures uh, from the sclera, even to the skin, just to keep the eye adducted the first day or two, so that you get some kind of attachment that helps you in retrieving the muscle. Would you? I, I, I haven't tried, but it, it theoretically it makes sense. Uh... So the stay suture actually helps when you have a scar tissue forming. Uh, for example, if this was an endoscopic procedure done by an ENT specialist, that they munched through not only the sinus but also the medial rectus is a very different animal. And in those cases, you know that the inflammation is coming. It's just the mucosa of the, the, the sinuses and the bone fragments and many other things, exudations cause this. And in, in those particular variations, or when you know that the, there was a fat violation or, or the fibrosis is going to happen, I think the stay suture is more indicated in those cases. As soon as you release the scar tissue and have some movement, you keep them in the opposite movement that they're going to scar. And, and um, I don't think it will be indicated in a, in a lost or pulled into or any other muscle at this point. Well, it's something that every one of us will come across one day. And I think you can never be prepared for that. And uh, every case will have its own decision at that point. But congratulations, Dr. Orge. I mean, you had quite a nerve that day to manage it in such a way and had such a, a happy ending for your case. Um, what we have, um, uh, for the sake of time, we're going to move on, but before we move on to the last case, uh, Dr. Olge, would you like to share with us, uh, uh, shown your, uh, the simulator and uh, your online teaching system? I'll be honored to, and, and uh, so let me actually put it up. Um, so for people who have not uh, uh, seen this uh, through the Academy um, and the partnership with American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and, and um, um, and strabismus. So APOS and AEO got together with the funds from the Knights Templar Foundation. Uh, we had formed about now six, seven years ago, uh, the Pediatric Ophthalmology Education Center. So if you don't remember anything that I tell you to, to today or tonight, um, just remember the Pediatric Ophthalmology Education Center, because it is the biggest library. We have about close to two, I think 1.5, if not close to 2 million heads from 215 uh, countries um, to this site. And, and uh, one thing that, that we wanted to make sure that people um, um, learn and see, because I know that how much I struggled learning strabismus because, because it's so visual. You need to see patients again and again to really understand the concepts. Uh, we wanted to launch a, a, a simulator. And this is, I'm going to talk about the, and, and there are two types of um, strabismus simulators. There's a basic type and there's a complex type. Um, at least I'll launch the, the first one. And the other one that you were seeing is also we have the retinoscopy simulator. Um, so these simulators are as if a patient is sitting in front of you. So you go and if you Google the Pediatric Ophthal Ophthalmology Education Center, or if you Google strabismus simulator, this will come up. And when you start it, there are two modes to this. There's an explore mode, and we're going to go into that. And that actually teaches you the concepts and how to use them. Now, when you're confident, you can test yourself. So um, I actually use this uh, not only for education and my fellows and residents and medical students and technicians and, and orthoptists, but also the patients. They, they really don't understand why are you doing surgery in both eyes, but um, or for, for when my left eye is deviating. So um, let's go through the explore mode. 
and there are certain things that, that we do. There are four tests. Can everybody still see it? Is that is the video yes, running fine? Do, yeah, yes, yeah. Follow. And, great. And this fixation targets becomes more important in the complex strabismus. We'll get to that. The basic type, the, the basic strabismus simulator is, is a cometan strabismus simulator, meaning the deviation is always the same amount wherever you look. Um, so the, the fixation target is less of relevant, you can actually turn that off. There is a prism that you can put in front of the eye. You can turn the prism in, in different directions and, and the, yeah, put the prism in it, I get it, uh, but it's just a simulate and on how um, it, it kind of cancels the movement and that was the, the way that we predicted it. And you can actually, there's an occluder that you can occlude uh, either eye. And you can choose either, either the right eye or the left eye to be the dominant. So in this case, we're going to keep the right eye dominant. And we're going to give, and it goes exo. When you go to the negative, it goes to iso. And then, then you can do these tests. The cover, uncover tests or alternate cover testing um, or a prism cover testing. We'll, we'll turn this every eye. You still see there's deviation, but if you hit the prism to be just the right amount, then you know you see no deviation. Now you know that this person has a 30 prism diopters of esotropia. Not only it's written there, but I, you can see it too, because that's for you as well. And um, so hidden strabismus, as students and fellows, um, it actually is a hidden. So when you do a cover and cover test, it may re not reveal itself, but if you break the fusion for a while, in this case, the simulator waits two seconds. If you do that enough, then the Fourier kicks in. And if you um, un uncover, then the eye kind of recovers, or you can actually induce it by doing an alternate cover testing. So if you have a condition, which actually is so common that we see in our clinic, um, you, as you know, um, if you have tropia and, and, and foria at the same time, you can actually um, measure the, the total amount by doing the alternate cover testing. And if you put a prism in front of it, it actually cancels each other. And then you know exactly what the sum of all is. But if you really wanted to know in, in real life or even, even in the simulator what the tropia is, so you know the sum, so tropia and the foria was 45. And if you want to only depict the the, um, the tropia itself to decipher what is tropia, what is foria. Uh, there is a tool here, which is called a, uh, caused in the simultaneous prism cover testing. And it only measures the, the tropia. So you cover simultaneously with the prism and, and the occluder, and it simulates that. And if you hit the right amount with the tropia, it would actually have no movement. So and this is, these are the four tests that you can actually do with the simulator. And then you can go to the test mode and test yourself. Every time you go in there, there are three new um, uh, studies or patients in front of you that you don't know what's going on and you're tested on. In the complex strabismus though, um, you will see A and B patterns. You will see Brown syndrome, DVD, DHD. We're working on many others. Now we're looking into these uh, uh, incompetent strabismus. Um, um, hopefully soon we're going to, we're working on a, maybe a virtual platform of a clinic so that you maybe go into a clinic that there are 10 patients in, in different rooms and you can actually examine them, maybe make a, a diagnose not only that, choose what surgery to do, give glasses and see what happens. So um, thank you for allowing me to, to share this, Amr, and, and um, I'm um, just going to stop we're there. We're for very the thankful for, uh, for showing us this. And I know you worked a lot in developing this simulator. And uh, for any of you who haven't tried it, it's free online. Anyone can go on and try it. I use it in teaching my students. I show it to my patients sometimes, to my colleagues. It's, a, it's very interesting to play around with it. Uh, please, if you haven't tried it, please go ahead and try it. And um, now we move on to the last case for today. Not the least, actually the last and the most interesting of them. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Farid uh, will take over and Dr. Ibrahim Al-Adawi will present the case. Thank you, Dr. Amr. Uh, we will move to Dr. Ibrahim Al-Adawi as he, he's got an interesting case about uh, unusual presentation and management of a case of severe oblique palsy. You can go, Dr. Ibrahim. Please share. Okay.
Uh, this child presented in February 2013 with head tilt to the right. Uh, by examination of the child, uh, unfortunately, the, the is a troublemaker and I cannot take a good photo at this uh, time. Uh, I diagnosed the case of left superior oblique palsy. And I uh, mentioned to the parent that he will need surgery in the left eye, and sometimes he may develop the same pathology in the right eye after doing the surgery. Okay. Uh, uh, this is uh, after immediately after uh, surgery. I did a left inferior oblique myectomy, and this is the first postoperative photos. Next. In March 2013, immediately after one month, the patient developed head tilt to the left. After two months, the full-blown picture of bilateral musket superior oblique palsy with right inferior oblique overaction with head tilt to the left, and we prepared for surgery. I did right inferior oblique myectomy. And this, unfortunately, the, the first post-operative photo, I noticed the head is tilted again to the right with a small left hypertrophia again. Next. The patient to travel abroad with his family <coughs> and return after one and a half year with full blowing picture of another left superior oblique palsy with left inferior oblique overaction, which is already myectomized. And usually after cutting the, the, the segment of the inferior oblique, I push the proximal end of the inferior oblique into the tenon capsule and close the opening with, with field cutter in, all, in, in order not to at, reattach again to a wrong place in the sclera. Uh, uh, this is the, for, for the first time to meet such case after doing the, the other eye, the, the basology or the hypertrophia, they care again in the uh, first eye. Uh, I prepared for another surgery. I explore again the inferior oblique and I uh, find everything's okay. So I did left superior oblique tucking. But uh, uh, actually I did very mild tucking about four to five millimeter because I was afraid the, uh, the first time to do inferior oblique and uh, myectomy together with uh, superior oblique tucking. Next. This is the ball yes. audience. And the question was about uh, when do you do superior oblique tucking as a first procedure in superior oblique balls? You can share your answer. I think it's going to be one of those where it's going to be very divisive. You're going to have a lot of different answers. Unless I consider a successful poll when you have like no agreement or something. Yes, Dr. Ram. I cannot show the results from my side because I am sharing. Dr. Ram. I will show. Okay. Everyone sees the result now, I think. So, 47% uh, of the attendants choose not to do superior oblique tuck as the first procedure in superior oblique pulse. Okay. Okay, Dr. Ibrahim, we will continue. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Usually, before the first surgery, I did the force induction test, and uh, usually, I, uh, I, don't start superior oblique tucking except in very lax superior oblique tendon. But in this case, uh, uh, with oblique traction test, I feel well the superior oblique tendon. So, uh, 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 although there is some laxity, but uh, not too lax. Uh, uh, this is in 2015. Uh, again, I reopened, I revised the 
superior oblique tuck and we make another superior oblique tuck in eight millimeter. And this is the post-operative uh, photos in September 2015. Next. After three weeks. Next. After three months, and it's still okay until now. Uh, uh, this is the first time to see this complication. Why the symptoms or the signs of superior palsy reappear again in the previous eye, although after complete uh, inferior oblique tenectomy, tenotomy, uh, myectomy? Uh, uh, are any one of our uh, dear? colleagues uh, see such a case yes we will ask them to Ibrahim okay. thank you thank you dr. Ibrahim for the nice case indeed and uh, we will move to dr. Barsa to ask him about uh, how to predict uh, the musket bilateral severe palsy preoperatively there is any way to predict the uh, presence of musket bilateralism uh, well, yes, I mean, um, it's, one has to really keep it in mind. Uh, uh, Jampolsky says, presume that all unilateral superior oblique palsies are bilateral until proven otherwise. And um, one has to, you know, it's difficult sometimes with a child who is not very cooperative, as in this case here, it, it was hard to get pictures, but, you know, one obviously looks at the uh, adduction, the hypertrophy and adduction of each eye. Um, what I find particularly useful is to look at the ocular fundus torsion. Yes. And, and that is, I think, the, the biggest advance that we've had since, you know, von Norden introduced that uh, in terms of unmasking these uh, otherwise masked uh, bilateral superior oblique palsies. Um, there have been other rules when you see a, a, a large uh, a torsional component over 10 degrees that it's probably bilateral. Um, and there's a number of, you know, just things that one tries to do during an exam. As I said, not always easy with children. But I think looking at the fundus uh, torsion is the best help. Now, sometimes when the, the normal position of the fovea, it, it, when you look at the fundus and with respect to the optic nerve is in the bottom third of the nerve we say and what if someone initially had their fovea at the you know higher up and then you now they're palsied and that they're still within the range of what we consider normal uh, we can be fooled in those cases it looks on fundus torsion to be within normal range but it's actually x cycle rotated from its previous position. there what sometimes helps is to look at the vascular arcades the vascular arcades are more or less uh, symmetrical and, and horizontal, slightly x cycle rotated. But when you move away, not just looking at the fovea uh, disc relationship, which can be hard in children, you know, they're not yes. same. But you can see the vascular arcade if it's in cycle rotated or x cycle rotated more easily. It, it, it doesn't give you a precise quantitative measure, yes. but a very good qualitative assessment very quickly in a moving child whether the eye is in cycle rotated or x cycle rotated, then you can see if it's bilateral or unilateral. That's, what, that's is, what about the time gap? What about the time gap for development of bilateralism? Do you see it uh, shortly after the first surgery? Or it takes some time. It can, it, can, it can be pretty quickly afterwards. Quickly. You know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and did you manage them quickly? Or you wait some time for the second surgery? It depends, but you know, if, they, if they're fusing, you can, you know, wait. You certainly would wait until the, fir the first surgery has healed. Um, okay. There's no immediate rush. One thing I'll add, um, when one does an inferior oblique uh, procedure, weakening procedure, and sometimes uh, I see with some of the residents, they, they don't get, that the exaggerated force ductions that David Guyton introduced in the field to see how tight the inferior oblique muscle is at the time of surgery, one can do that in both eyes too, before you start operating, is check, do you feel a tight inferior oblique or not? And also check at the other eye. You know, that could give you another tip if you've missed uh, a bilateral yes. superior oblique muscle. So you, you assess how tight it is in the other eye, even though you, you didn't think that there's something there. And um, 
after in the first, uh, let's say you don't see it in the other eye, but after you uh, disinsert the inferior oblique muscle from the first eye, repeat the four abductions, the exaggerated force, to see if you're, you're sure you got all the fibers. Because the inferior oblique muscle, uh, it's very easy, even under direct visualization, even with a microscope, to miss some of the fibers yes. in the hook. I mean, some of them even have bifid insertions. And if I don't do an, a second exaggerated force abductions after disinserting, to be sure that I've got all the inferior oblique muscle, and you see that you have an under correction after your first surgery, you can assume that what happened is you didn't get all the fibers yes. in the first surgery. And I, I think that's something that has to be emphasized that we should always remember. What about, in your opinion, what about the second surgery? Is it the same uh, protocol of the first surgery or you ta will tailor the uh, second surgery according to the amount of hypertrophia? Do you treat bilateral, muscle bilateral symmetrically or? Yeah, I, I pretty much do, yeah. And, and sometimes if I see, now I'm very shy about doing superior oblique tucks. So my, what I might do before that is, is actually go and do another myectomy uh, of the inferior oblique. Yes. You know? um, okay. So that, that's the approach. Thank you. Thank I, have you. A, I have a question, if you, if you allow me, Dr. Mohammed, just to enrich the discussion at this point. Um, some of you might have heard the Dr. Plager saying, um, if, you have, if you're going for a unilateral superior oblique palsy and you, in the surgery, you find a lax superior oblique tendon in both eyes, you would expect this patient to be a masked bilateral. Do you agree with this or not? And uh, the, the, the question is Dr. Parson, Dr. Olge, and Dr. Radaway. And if yes, would you do the inferior oblique in the other eye in the same setting? I mean, in the surgery, do you do force seduction test on the other eye, on the superior oblique of the other eye, in order to predict if this is masked bilateral or not? Yes, I do. I do the traction test. But do actually, to change, to change the, uh, the scenario of surgery, the scenario of management based on the traction test on the other eye, intraoperatively, for me, I, I don't believe in this. Uh, I want to change my, uh, my plan regarding uh, the degree of uh, laxity of severe oblique tendon. Uh, though I will keep it in mind to check most operatively if the signs of bilateralism develop. Okay, so you, you, you do bilateral force, force reduction test? On yes, the I do bilateral to check for the laxity of the severe oblique tendon. Okay. But by the way, I don't, I don't do TAC based on this laxity of the severe oblique tendon. Okay, Dr. Orge, what, what would you do? Severe oblique tendon, case? for me, it guides me about the amount of tucking. Uh, okay. The amount of tucking, not to the decision of tucking. I base my decision of tucking based on the preoperative examination about uh, the degree of hypertrubia in different gaze positions. If I found the hypertrubia more in the direction of the action of the superior oblique muscle, I will think of superior oblique tucking. I agree. Yeah. I don't know if the other panelists they agree with me. In so we want to give the opinion of everyone almost about this. Uh, bilaterality, predicting the bilateral, because it's very frustrating when you do one eye and, and like a month later you see the patient to the other eye. Pa parents are not happy usually with that. No, they're not. Uh, Actually, I want to kind of add one more trick maybe to kind of decipher the bilaterality, and I agree with every, every um, comment that was made already. Uh, sometimes though, one other trick is when you kind of tilt the head to the other side, so let's see if I have a superior oblique and, and, and the right tilt and, and, and all the good, now if the hyper, left hyper becomes a right hyper, then you know that there's something more hidden there. So that's another tip to kind of think about. Um, and, and all these things, I mean, in a, in a, God knows, in a one-year-old, two-year-old, good, good, good luck doing that. And, and it, but, but all these things do add up. Um, and now, but coming back to, to the question on what to do, um, I 100% agree that, that I think what that the force deduction, exaggerated force deduction actually guides me on what to do. Um, I actually, my uh, first line of defense is the inferior oblique surgery in these cases because it's just uh, such a self um, 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 Forgive it. Uh, regulating type of a surgery. Adjusting, it really is adjusting. kind of adjusting. That's actually, thank you. That's was the word that I was kind of looking for. So even if you have a little hyper versus a significant hyper, um, in particularly myectomy in, in, my, in my hand works uh, well. Yeah.
Farouk, you're a bit breaking up on the sound, so um, uh, Farouk, we, we cannot hear you, so we will... Um, what, what I'll just add to and the... And again, um, um, if for the audience, um, maybe, uh, go with this. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So uh, just to kind of, as a reminder, we talked about uh, Dr. Um, Art Jampolsky, and, and this is, I think, from him, that the oblique and inferior oblique can come in so many different variations. I mean, look at look at how many different things that can happen to the, to the muscle. There's some problem with, with the voice of Dr. Uh, Farouk. Oh, don't hear uh, Dr. Faru, I'm afraid we, we I'm afraid we cannot hear you, Faru. So, um, Dr. Orge, we cannot hear you. So, um, we, we didn't hear the opinion of Dr. Parsa about this. Um, uh, uh, I'll just say this picture says it all. You know how easy it is to to miss fibers when you think you have the entire muscle in your hook because there are very very uh, variations on the insertion. Uh, what I would say add to, well, to what was just discussed about the inferior oblique muscle has been the first as being the first muscle to attack. Not only is it self-adjusting, it's so uh, forgiving. I have never seen a case of uh, overcorrection from yes. operating on the inferior oblique muscle. You, you will never get a hypotropia if you do from doing a denervation, extirpation of an inferior oblique muscle, you'll get, it, it, will, it will not last. It, it's, it, it's really a, a hard, if not impossible, to get an overcorrection from weakening the inferior oblique muscle. But with the superior oblique muscle, you can get all sorts of problems. Yes, yes. Hey, Dr. Barsa, what about, uh, in your opinion, the causes of recurrent over elevation in abduction? As we have noticed in this case. But, yes, well, I, I, what do you I, think of the other possible causes apart from missing inferior oblique fibers? I think it's the number one cause. That's by by large the number one cause. And other yeah. times, even when you have totally disinserted it, you've done the exaggerated force suctions. You know you disinserted it. It can it will reattach. It it, it always does reattach. Uh, even when you've done a myectomy. Uh, I, I noticed uh, Dr. Green was talking about suture, uh, cauterizing the, the opening in Tinan's capsule. Uh, I've, I've thought of suturing them, but I, I've heard from you know my mentors and others, it, it doesn't help. It still <laughs> it will still reattach to the globe somewhere eventually. So uh, it, it seems that we ought to be able to prevent it, but it does. And there's enough soft tissue attachments that it still always has some effect, unless you do what. Alexander Duane did in six, 1906, he would disinsert the inferior oblique from its origin on the, on the bone. <laughs> so if you do that, oh. take, truly do an extirpation, then, then you're safe, but you get terrible bruises. And I, don't, I haven't heard of anybody doing it since Duane. So, so in such a situation, Dr. Parson, such a situation of recurrent overabduction, what's your target surgery? Do you will target the inferior oblique to re-weaken it again? Or do you think, as Dr. Ibrahim did, uh, to go to superior oblique to strengthen it? I, I try, as I said, I can't. It's been maybe a decade since I've gone to the super, uh, strengthening superior oblique. I try to avoid it at all costs. I'll do everything. Why, why Dr. Barsa? Well, because if, if it's in this case, he only had to do a small tuck, which is all right, you know. And if you only need to do a small tuck, I, I might think I'll do something else. If you have to do a large tuck, you're going to get a Brown syndrome. And even though it gets a little better with time, I don't find it satisfactory, absolutely necessary to go that route. There, there what if happened? Acquired and, and I'll mention one more thing that, that sometimes isn't emphasized enough. If you have a very lax superior oblique tendon, that's what happens oftentimes with a, a denervated superior oblique muscle. Uh, one where the trochlear nerve has been interrupted. And with a denervated muscle, it becomes lax, like uh, Craig Hoyt says, a wet noodle. And if you do a tuck, the result is only going to be temporary. Over time, the muscle is going, to, the tendon is going to be lax again. 
because any denervated muscle it becomes yes. relaxed. So it's only in cases where there's some partial innervation left that it might work. So in the cases where you would think, you know, where the tendon is extremely lax, the tuck isn't going to work. It's not going to work long term. And many in of case of acquired brown, uh, acquired uh, six nerve. Uh, if it happens, nerve. if it happens, what are the possible ways of management? Uh, not many good ones. Tuck before? Did you release the tuck before? I, I, uh, I, I, as I said, I, I is it releasable? Is it releasable? In your opinion? Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Mohammed, it is releasable. You can actually reverse releasable? it. Can you hear me okay? It seems yes, like okay, I'm okay, that's fine. Now. You can use it. And, and doctor, uh, I would really urge you to maybe look into Dr. Saunders' uh, paper that actually really uh, describes eloquently how to adjust it. I can tell you, Browns is so easy, and actually, uh, where I did my training, and uh, Dr. Helveston had this series of Brown syndrome so that. Old Indiana was, I think, tainted with that, and, and a lot of people kind oh, of- Oh, we're talking about an, a, a surgical brown versus the true brown. These are two different- I, I got it. So that yeah. when, you tuck, when you tuck it, though, so can you undo it? Yes, you, you can. Um, so does it work all the time? No, it doesn't. It depends on how you've done the surgery. Just like when, when we were looking at Dr. Nihal's case, uh, the first surgery has to be pristine, and you need to do, know, know exactly what you're doing. And Dr. Saunders actually invented a little device, Rick Saunders, and that actually kind of tells you how much to tuck. And, and um, so it, 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 it has a spring mechanism that actually kind of really calibrates and how you do a force suction before and after guides you if you've done it too much or not. Um, and actually, um, Dr. Archer from, from Michigan in particular, they do superiorly tucks probably more than anybody. I, I, I just wouldn't do it that much anyhow, but that's, that's their to-go muscle. And I think they use the same method and, and that predictability has been helpful is all I'm saying. So. I, I am not, uh, my first go-to muscle is not superior big either, um, but, but I do touch it fairly frequently for different reasons. Um, I prefer to go okay. to the aerobic, but if you do a tuck, do it in that fashion. I think that would be very useful. I'll okay. add one to my French okay. Okay. You can, as I have last, to. In France, the superior oblique muscle is the first go-to muscle. Mm -hmm. And I was astonished when I first saw them, and then I, I watched them operate and I asked, you know, they're presenting all these wonderful results. And I said, well, don't you get a Brown syndrome afterwards? And the answer is, of course, but who cares about looking up gays? <laughs> uh, so that's the that. things. <laughs> I mean, we can actually tell, uh, yeah, we yeah, can know from the poll now that we don't have a lot of attendees from France. So a, a lot of people didn't decide to disappear <laughs> with the hugging first. <laughs> hey, last, last comment to all the panelists regarding the Technique, the preferred technique of free weakening of inferior oblique in just one uh, bullet. Dr. Ibrahim, if you are going to re weaken the inferior oblique, what's your preferred method? Uh, according to the uh, original weakening procedure, uh, if I had the inferior oblique recession, I, uh, I can make a inferior oblique anterioralization, inferior oblique myectomy, nasal myectomy. Uh, but I want to commend uh, okay. the, the recurrence of high of, high, of over elevation and abduction or the recurrence of inferior oblique over action in the left eye. If uh, I think if there is uh, missing fibers in the inferior oblique, uh, the the head tilt will not be corrected and the superior oblique policy will not appear in the other eye. So uh, uh, it is yes. recurrence, not residual. If there is a residual inferior oblique over action, if you missed yes. some fibers from the inferior oblique, the condition will be still uh, as such, yes. not yes. to be corrected, and the other eye develop a uh, superior yes. oblique policy. Uh, Dr. Barsa? Yeah, the preferred no, that's method that's of reweakening. Probably true. And I wasn't uh, trying to say the that. The preferred method of reweakening of inferior oblique. Yeah, but uh, one could do a reweakening. Uh, if you, if, you know, in your you, practice, yes, yeah, and you can do denervation extirpation to try and get even greater result. It's not you don't always find the neurovascular bundle. Uh, I sometimes okay. have trouble finding it. Uh, David Guyton gave me a tip. He says if you can't feel the neurovascular bundle that you want to cut to to get even to to release the muscle to get a, do a bigger myectomy, you can go blindly in the muscle a third of the way in from the edge using cautery so that if you cut it with cautery so you're also cauterizing the blood vessel uh, so you don't yeah. get and so you can blindly try that way that's a tip he recently gave me because i said you know sometimes i i simply can't find that nerve 
because it's too deeply buried in the muscle. So blind cautery can help. And that way you can do a, a bit more greater myectomy. Yes. And finally with Dr. Farouk. Dr. Orge. That seems he has a connection problem. Um, we hit okay, our time. time. We had to hit our limit on time, so we're gonna have we have to conclude. Actually, this webinar turned out to be much more interesting than what I thought it would be. Um, we had a very distinguished assortment of panelists here that that enriched the discussion, and uh, we're sure these discussions can go on for hours and hours, and we can never actually, you know, that's the interesting thing about strabismus and pediatric ophthalmology. Not everyone does it the same way. Everyone does it in their own different way, and somehow it works. Um, although we do it different ways. Uh, everyone, I really enjoyed the discussion myself. I'm sure everyone did. Uh, we wish we had more time uh, for the audience. This is going to be our last uh, event in Ramadan and we have the next week off, but uh, expect more events. It's gonna be always every Tuesday, but next week is off as we said, and it's gonna be different. We have, we have more interesting uh, panels. We have um, new things, exciting. We're gonna, we're gonna have uh, to publish that soon. Um, I have to say thank you for the audience for staying that late. Uh, thank you for the panelists, every single one of you, for enriching the discussion in that way. And um, we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>